Hello everyone, welcome to KU Radio Science powered by Khalifa University. My name is Karen and I'm going to be your host for today's episode. If you're new to our channel, make sure that you like and give us a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button so you never miss out on our episodes. This month in February is the UAE Innovation Month, and it's a time where we're celebrating innovators, creative ideas, people that are making groundbreaking waves within different sectors. So in light of this, we're launching our very first podcast for this series with a very special guest, Dr. Peter Corridon, who is from the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Biotechnology at Khalifa University. How are you? Jet lagged, but I'm okay. <laughs> okay, so Dr. Peter, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Um, sure. So I moved here in 2019 to start the medical program. I was, I think, faculty number five or six, somewhere along those small digits. And since then, I've been open to new cultures, new views, new thoughts because I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago, but grew up between there and New York and studied all my life within the States, few stints in Europe, but primarily, as I tell people, my work ethic is New York, but my lifestyle is the crew. Yes. <laughs> so you said you moved in 2019. That was right before COVID. So how was that for you when you came all the way here? It was a lot of things. So initially it was very exciting. Again, I went through another bout of jet lag that I'm going to right now. And we were moving along pretty steadily because we had no time to delay because the medical school was really on track and I had to jump on the train to make sure we were headed to the right place. And then all of a sudden things halted. Actually, I was in Jordan two weeks before the overall shutdown to do a recruitment event and recognizing having to scamper back from Jordan to here. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so and then everything else just, you know, well, the history tells it all. So how did you get into this field? So to this field, when we say the slaughterhouse base in particular, that's, well, COVID. So for me, slaughterhouse waste is always a value because back in the day, I come from a hardcore tissue and engineering background where we had specific types of animals that we would utilize. We'd rear and grow our own animals, utilize surgeries and so forth. So I had my group of animals that I would take care of, from rats all the way up to pigs. Moving here, pandemic, nothing to go on. We basically relied on some of the quick and dirty regimens that we used before. You would go down to your local butcher, collect a few tissues, you know, do a couple models just to kind of check before you go into an animal and recognizing that there was no other way in which we can get solid tissues, I went back to that trap. So what kind of animals exactly can we use for, in terms of slaughterhouse waste for regenerative medicine? So actually the entire gamut. So sometimes I present and, you know, lots of people laugh because the slide I have that I use a lot relates to chickens going all the way to camels. And technically speaking, you can. Because even with the eggs, you can develop embryo models. And from the camels, you have tons and tons of tissues that can be reutilized. Okay. That's very interesting. So can, let's just go back a little bit. So you are at the forefront of regenerative medicine, technologies that repurpose slaughterhouse waste. Can you explain how your research leverages waste to do this exactly? Sure. So think of it, right? You, well, when I say think of it, Try to envision, because not a lot of people have slaughterhouse experience, and rightfully so. So you see the end product in the groceries. However, before you get to that point, you have these large open fields, which basically you're rearing a bunch of different animals for consumption. Then from there, they go to these processing plants, and basically you have the combination of a carcass being divided into edible, and then also offals always. So we generally garner all the waste because that waste would in turn now be either rendered for um, biofertilizers, burnt, or some cases just landfill. So for our cases, if we can actually take those tissues like a useless lung, for instance, or a wasted kidney or an eyeball that no one will take away, that's how we're repurposing these things. 
Then how do you, because you said you take all types of waste, right? How do you then ensure that you're maintaining this standard of consistency when you're getting this waste? That's a good one. So the way in which I've been regulating this so far is, as you can see, I'm clearly dressed for that. So I'm there in the field with our team. So we go in and I, I can't deny that it was extremely difficult in the beginning. You know, I had people thinking, is he trying to make Frankenstein or is he crazy or is this legitimate? But then we have so much support from the Abu Dhabi municipality and the local slaughterhouse, which is the top one that we have in the region. And yeah, we literally go in, collect different things, and we've been teaching the individuals exactly what we need and how to get it. So my idea is you start really small and you gain the momentum because the idea is to get up to an industrial scale. But again, that's, I would say, within a decade coming. How many people are you working with currently, right? Now? So our team, we have a lot of really sharp young people. So the team, honestly speaking, if we had to gather in all the soldiers, we'd have about 10 strong. But we try not to go 10 strong to the slaughterhouse on a day that, well, let me put it this way. Eid is coming up. And I think this is something oh, that I was thinking about as this well. Is be, so, yeah. I mean, there would definitely be high periods during the year, right? Where you yeah. get this. So there's generally you have, you know, massive consumption throughout. But like for us during this period of time, this is like Christmas for us. So I will have to assemble this full strong team then. Right. Okay. What is the process of decellular, decellularizing tissues from slaughterhouse waste? No worries, that, yeah, that is a mouthful. It is so, a mouthful. <laughs> it is, it is a mouthful. <laughs> so decellularizing, literally break it down from the idea of D versus cellularizing, D to take away, to move apart, and the cellular components within the tissue. Because the tissues are generally made up of the cells and the surrounding structure. So for instance, within our environment here, you and I can be considered as cells in this tissue environment. So the idea is to get you and I out of the studio. And that's what we do within the tissue. And so then, of course, you just explained decellularizing. So we know now what recellularizing is. How do you address issues related to immune rejection? So that is something that's vastly complicated because when you think of immune rejection, you have to think of immunogenicity and you have to think of the processes that relate to that. And you have innate versus adaptive versus something that's even far-fetched that we may not be able to even, how can I say, comprehend because of the complexities that relate in cellular compartments, in tissue compartments, and also in vivo compartments. So for us, we try to take it one step at a time. We're now in the process of reintroducing different types of cells. And because it takes so long to ensure that the tissues are really good quality. Right. Because again, remember... How long does this process then take for you to realize it? So if you want to do it really properly, really, really carefully and systematically, it took us for about two to three years. And that is also adding into COVID time. So you could have pushed this down to a smaller period. But I think the fact that we had to have these delays and figure things out as we go by sequentially turned out to be really, really serendipitous. What is a bio supercapacitor? All right. So I think that's a good start with this. So when you hear bio supercapacitor, let's take it back from the idea of capacitor. And then we'll build up. So capacitor or a capacitor or capacitance is the ability to store charge. Then from there, the distribution of charges that actually creates the flow. And that relates to the whole idea of energy consumption and energy utilization. So for us, we're looking at building, technically speaking, batteries off of tissues. So if you build up, how can I say, you multiplex these batteries, you can end up with something that's larger scale or super. Similar to the fact that, you know, when you're charging your Tesla, you can plug it into the regular wall, plug it into the Tesla base charger, or you can go to the super charger. That's what we're kind of thinking things along. How do you envision bio supercapacitors working in the field of organ transplantation? So for us, well, you have implants. So several years ago when I had the ability to work with one of the coolest people that I think I've ever known was the guy who created the Super Soko. You know those toy guns? He did a whole lot more besides that. He actually supported one of my master's works and we were building implantable devices and we had to actually power them with something. So he was powering them with variations of heat within the body compared to internal versus external. So what we're trying to do now is look at figuring out ways to use the tissues 
to store these charges and have a component of that potentially within one of our bioartificial tissues that can in turn relay information on the quality and functionality of said tissue post-implantation. Great. That went way over my head, <laughs> but that's fine. I'm sure other people will understand. So how does your research in bioartificial organs and bio supercapacitors super address broader environmental concerns? So for us, the, the key is the interface that we, how can I say, exist. We exist at a point where we're collecting slaughterhouse waste and then moving it away from being either rendered or incinerated or broken down into something that can be harmful. Like uh, fertile, right? Don't they use this as well yeah, for fertilizer? Exactly. But not all of it goes into fertile. So some of it actually just goes literally into the ground where you can develop things like leachates. And think about it, right? For our area here, we have tons of seawater. We don't have tons of regular fresh water, i.e. the desert. So we need to be really careful about the natural resources we have. Because what can happen is if you have these leachates, they can actually go and spread out like veins into the natural water system and back into the agricultural system. So generating a loop of harmfulness. So if we can kind of minimize that, I think this goes hand in hand with what you asked. How many um, slaughterhouses do you currently work with? One in particular. Yeah, so I specialize and I focus with this group. And long term as we go by, the idea would be to expand. Again, you know, the idea of industrial, how can I say, movement. But for this, you really want to make sure that you have it very, very well with one specific model. And then that can be manipulated into, you know, many. Yeah, of course. So I have to ask, um, when we're talking about sustainability, we're going to have a lot of people come in. They want to be sustainable, but they're also going to say things like, how are you ensuring that this is inclusive for the vegan population or inclusive in terms of being cruelty free? What would you what would you say to that? Well, that's a big one. You you put me back to when I was in grad school and I would go finishing surgeries in the basement of my university or hospital and then I would go have dinner have drinks and then sit down next to people from Peter, the animal you know, <laughs> organization. And they'll be yeah. like, oh, we pick it in against IU. And I was like, I just put my hat down. <laughs> I had less to say back then because the idea was we're trying to do something really good. Now, from this stance, I can say that we're really doing something better because the, how can I say, arguably the largest regulator of any sort of medical innovation, the FDA, within the U.S. has mandated the reduction in animal models. So what we're doing now is not adding to any new animal models. We basically tapped into the food chain. So I'm not just tapped into the food chain, but tapped in in such a way to minimize the waste. And if these things come about, what we can start doing is, and this is something that not, how can I say, it's not listed on what we're doing now, but something where we're going. If we can start building up these tissues, we can start building up meat. So the idea would be then in this case, we can actually bioprint food. Like 3D printing, but for food. Isn't that something that's already People being are doing done? that, yeah. yeah and exactly. this is where we go into our next step. But it's not done here yet in the not UAE. Yet. So you're going to be the first. Inshallah. Okay. Inshallah. <laughs> I, like, yeah, I always like saying that, inshallah. Of course. What do you think is the general um, sentiment right now? I mean, I'm sure that you speak to a lot of people. You meet a lot of people that are outside of your field of expertise. How do you think they react when you say, okay, I'm going to use, let's say, a goat's cornea to build an organ? What, what do they say about that? Oh, get out of here. You're crazy. Oh, I've heard those terms. I also have the, you know, just, just the black look. look. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. And then more interestingly now as we go by, because I just don't say that anymore, I show. So they're like, really, how are, how are you going to do this, you know? And then we just start explaining, you know, building up and recognizing that xenotransplantation doesn't have to be the beginning all and end all. It's an option. So you still have choice. But most importantly, I think people need to recognize is if you give someone a choice, to have the ability to live longer, they will choose it. We definitely think about 
ourselves and survival is our survival instinct, right? Yeah, we wired to self-preserve. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter. My pleasure. For your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure to have you on our channel. Really grateful for this. And I hope you guys learned something. And for the general audience, if this was valuable, please subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell. And so you can actually get to learn more topics that are coming up and specifically within our UAE Innovation Lab. Thanks.